Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Yazid. Uh, I'm a Nico Fellow in St. Mike's Hospital. And uh, today I will present about basics of Doppler. Truly, I collect this one. It's like for me to learn and to share whatever I have found and uh, show how important is Doppler. I know most of us, they hate whenever they read about Doppler because it is physics. The physics, usually we read it just before the exam, oh, just to ask yeah, the exam. <laughs> and memorize the numbers and that's it, we forget it forever. However, sometimes it's good to have the basic knowledge, the understanding, so whenever we face any uh, abnormalities or any uh, uh, abnormal signal, we can understand the idea. So sounds, it's a mechanical vibration that travel in a medium in a way of frequency, which is measured by hertz. And we will see, so, and it's measured by uh, how many, uh, by hertz, which is how many cycles per second. And you'll see why this is uh, important. I, I tried my best not to bring anything, it's irrelevant. So the whenever the frequency of the sound is more than 20,000, it cannot be perceived by human. So this is why it's called ultrasound. And there is also infrasound. So in the medical field, our probes usually it's run between 1.5 to 7.5 megahertz. When we say K, it's thousand. When we say mega, it's million. So and this is the range in general. However, um, if we check that is the, our usual probe, which is uh, five, which means from one to five megahertz, and this is the pediatric probe from two to nine, and there is for really young uh, uh, babies, it's from four to twelve because. The higher the frequency, the better the resolution. But what's the problem? The higher the frequency, the lower the depth. So in, in, in pediatric, you can use high frequency because you are sacrificing the depth, you don't need it. And their chest is most of it cartilage, so you can access from anywhere. However, in adult, we have specific windows and there is a depth and if there is a fat, if, if emphysema, I mean, I mean COBD or uh, Bad person, it's, it will be a bit difficult. So this is the um, the wave sounds. How does it look? So each from the start going up, this is amplitude. Also down, up here it's one cycle. So whenever you start in a place and in, in the same place, this is one cycle, and each cycle has its length. Okay. So if we imagine that this is all our one second. How many cycles we have? We have from here to here, one, two, three, four, for example, like that. And this will decide, the length of the cycle will decide how high is our frequency. Is it low frequency or high frequency? And upon that, we depend on the, like, it will make difference in the penetration, in the uh, resolution, and we will see about also the Doppler, uh, like limitation. So how does this frequency came? It came from the uh, basoelectrical crystal that found in the head of the probe. So it has the ability to convert the electrical energy to mechanical sounds and also receive these mechanical sounds when it came back and convert it to uh, electrical energy. And then you can see the display of the image, regardless, is it a 2D, Doppler, or whatever. So it will send the waves, it will hit whatever structure and it will come back and it will be interpreted. And this is an example of a, a 2D and Doppler together in the same image. So whatever sector that you are involving in the heart, it will be represented in your screen. For the 2D, it will show you the anatomy, the structures uh, and the consistency of the tissue. And for the Doppler, it can show you the velocity, the amplitude, and the direction of the Doppler, of the blood inside the heart. So this is some differences between the Doppler and the 2D. I will keep it just for you. So what is Doppler to start with? So he's a scientist. He's a physicist. His name is Christian Doppler. Uh, 
he used to look at the stars and see the difference in color and uh, okay. guess that by the frequency and change of color, is this star is coming toward or going away or this frequency is coming toward or going away. And later it's known uh, the idea, the difference in frequency between uh, emitted and received frequency. It's known by the Doppler shift or sometimes the Doppler effect. Both are the same. And uh, I would refer you to this uh, article, which is like talk about him in uh, some details. So it's like when you when you hear the ambulance coming toward you with a high sound, and whenever it goes from you, it starts to slow down. So uh, I think I uh, because the sound is not there, but uh, I prepared the video. Always there is Plan B. So <laughs> the sounds when when things pass toward you and go far. This is the best example I have seen in YouTube. So it's really, when it's coming toward you, the voice is, the frequency is getting high and high and high, then whenever it's going from you, it will be lower in frequency and it start to, speak, to feel slower. It's the same mechanism in the frequency, okay? The same mechanism in the ultrasound. And the device can detect, is there a change of frequency or not? So, if we say that, the, uh, for Doppler, it's mainly depend on the RBCs, so it will send the frequency. This is the F for frequency, T for transmitted, and R for received. So it will send the frequency. The device know how much, how fast is this frequency, and then will wait and receive this frequency. If it came in the same frequency, no change, he will know that this object is stationary. It's in the same place. It did not change. It did not move away. It did not come towards. However, if the blood is moving toward the probe, regardless is it going from the LV to the RV, wherever the direction, if it's coming toward the probe, there will be higher frequency, like the sound we hear, and it will be coded. The, the red and blue color is just a coding. It can be anything. It can be green and white, whatever color it can be for. Whenever, and when it sends the frequency, and the frequency came back in a lower, it, it will know that it is going away from you. And this is exactly the Doppler shift. It's the difference between the going frequency, the transmitted frequency, and the received interpreted frequency. So it depends on a lot of things. It's like uh, the transmitted frequency, the speed of the tissue, the target velocity. The machine just needs from you a good angle. Doesn't care about anything else. No need to memorize anything. Yes. It will say, give me a good angle, and I will give you the best signal that I have. So it will be plotted in, in uh, Y and X. So anything, if we imagine the probe is here, anything is coming toward the probe, it will be coded as red, and anything going away, it will be coded as blue. And there is a velocity, like from zero up to whatever cut you can put, depending on the Nicholas limit. So if you can see here, it is dark and getting start, like to paint and be more lighter, it's the same idea you see here. And we know that we can change that necklace or we can change the scale and it's just expanding this, uh, this color box. Uh, so as we said, it's just the difference in frequency between the transmitted and received. And what we know that sometimes we can just use the sound. So why we can hear it? because it's within the audible range. This is why we can hear Doppler. You cannot hear the frequency like of the 2D, but you can hear Doppler because it's still within the less than like 20,000. So we can hear it. As we said, uh, they are really emphasizing on the angle of the Doppler because we have something we call the cosine. We multiply whatever number we have in this angle. So if the angle is zero, you are 100% parallel to the flow, there will be no underestimation and it will give you the true speed, the true velocity of that structure. Because sometimes you can pulse uh, the, the tissue, uh, the annulus, isn't it? Not just the blood. So we try always as much as we can to uh, minimize the angle, make it zero as much as possible. 
because every increase in the angle, it will cause a decrease in the interpreted velocity. So as we can see in this uh, image, that the lower, uh, the higher we are from zero, if you get zero, you will, your uh, angle will be multiplied by, your velocity, I mean, will be, will be multiplied by one. Anything in one will result in the same number. However, the more you are deviated from zero, you will get 10, it will be multiplied, for example, by 9.98, and then 0.90, and the lower, the higher the angle, the lower the velocity. Uh, and there is like agreement that anything above 20 angle, you should not like trust this, uh, this uh, velocity. And to make it simple for us, they, they brought this schedule and they said, whatever actual velocity you imagine, like multiply it by the cosine. For example, if we have a patient and his true peak velocity at the aortic valve is 4.2. So if you multiply by, by 0.94, what do we have? <laughs> I want something people proactive. Something? What? Three something. Yeah, three something, 3.5, around 3.5. So instead of clearly severe aortic stenosis, it will be really underestimated. And the, and the cause is just the angle. This is why the aortic valve is one of the most important things that we try to take it from other uh, area uh, because we depend on the velocity. However, imagine this with every single uh, inflow outflow thing like mitral stenosis, mitral regurg, aortic stenosis, uh, stroke volume, anything you will underestimate this thing. So the better the angle, the better the so velocity, the worse the angle, like 90 degree, you will not see anything. We will see an example. This is always we see it. Like the blood is coming toward, and when it's reached here, what will be? It will be totally black because it's totally 90 degree. So it cannot interpret, is it going toward or away? And you can see here very nicely, it's coming in a red and going in a blue in the same human, just as, and interpretation. And if you if you see to the color map, you, you can see it here, exactly in the middle, that it is zero. Right? This is a, we and we know that there is a flow, but it cannot be interpreted. And this is one of the limitations. Also, it's important to know that sometimes why the coloration is like that. Because if we can see uh, from the our previous video that here it's coming toward, and here it's totally parallel uh, or perpendicular, and then it's going away. And this is important because to tell you that the velocity inside the lumen, inside the heart, is not the same. It's not like any bump. It's, it has a parabolic shape or curved shape. And if you look to the box, there are different names. However, this is all still within the laminar flow. When you see the color, it is all in the same, like, uh, like all are red, all are blue, and in uniform and nice shape. However, you, you may have some turbulence flow. So turbulence flow is either with stenosis, which is most common, uh, stenotic area, it's not per se like a stenotic valve, or if there is a very high velocity from white chamber to a narrower chamber. And with this currents, you start to have some different in colors. So because this, for example, if the probe is here, this will be coded as red, and the one here is blue, and when it's circling, it will give you blue, red, yellow, white, different type of colors. And we can see that, uh, that is it a laminar flow or a turbulent flow by the spectral doubler when it's high and like fuzzy and it's, it is turbulent, however, when it's uniform and crisp, it is usually uh, laminar. So we say that when we send the frequency, it will hit the blood, it will come back, it will test the Doppler shift, and we can know that the blood is coming toward or going away. So how this, does this going to be on the screen? It's, we call it the spectral analysis. So what the spectral analysis will give us? It will give us the velocity, 
it will give us the direction, it will give us the intensity, and over time. Okay, this is what we call spectral. This is it will be done by the machine, and also it can give us more than that. But this is like the general uh, general idea because it can give us also the VTI, the mean velocity, the mean gradient, and these other things. So uh, it is important just because sometimes if you just get this picture, you don't know is it from a TE from transthoracic. You just need to know that this is a zero line. Whatever above is going toward the probe, and whatever below is going away from the probe. Whatever high intensity, it is like too many RBCs are coming at this side. Whatever is fading, it is less RBCs, and and so on. Uh, so it's related to the probe direction and the blood. So when we talk about intensity, I just put this uh, talk for you if you want to read it later. But uh, what we say that the blood does not flow in the same time, like at once. We see, if we see here, we have acceleration, peak, deceleration, then followed by stage, then another axis. So overall, you need to, when we, do, when we put the pulse or our sector or whatever, it will just tell you the velocity of that blood at that place and how much, okay? The higher the intensity, the intensity represents how many RBCs are traveling at that place at that time, okay? It doesn't mean anything other than that, but you can play with the gain also and the uh, follows. So if we know the velocity and the direction, we should know what's called the pressure gradient. So the blood will not travel from one chamber to another by itself. It's need a pressure. It's need a difference in pressure between the, for example, the left atrium and the left ventricle, the left ventricle and the aorta, and, and so on, wherever chamber it goes. And sometimes can be reversed. And we have seen the aesthetic amount, and we have seen like uh, other flows. So this is what we call the pressure gradient, which is the difference of pressure between two chambers, as simple as that, which is the driving force of the blood to flow. So the blood, with this stenotic lesion, the blood cannot go there without a high, uh, or, uh, high uh, pressure inside the left atrium. This is one of the things that we can notice the LA pressure is really high. How can we know? By the pressure gradient. How much pressure was in the left atrium to push the blood to the left ventricle? And it helps us a lot to quantify uh, the stenotic lesion. Like, uh, what is the difference of pressure between the LV and the aorta? We can know how much stenotic is this aortic valve. It's one of the most important uh, thing. And the pressure and flow and velocity all are related together. However, you cannot get you cannot get it directly. By we cannot get the pressure directly or the flow, how much flow, for example, the stroke volume, we cannot get it directly. How you can get it? By the velocity. The velocity will come from the Doppler. Okay, so with Doppler, we can get velocity. With velocity, we can get gradient. With gradient, we can assist stenotic lesion. I tried my best to make it connected to each other, and I see eyes are going up and down. But okay. <laughs> so, always when we have any flow, we will just put the peak and it will give us the number. Like, the, it will give you the maximum velocity and then the maximum peak gradient or pressure gradient. So, how does it come with this number? Where does this number come from? Any idea? Yeah, what do we call it? Bernoulli. Bernoulli equation. It is as simple as that. 4 and square of the velocity. So, from where did it come? This is Daniel Grinoli. He's the one who, uh, he's a physicist also. He published a book in 1738. And it's, it, his idea of like uh, relation between pressure and velocity, it was taken and formulated to this uh, formula that we have by Leonard. And what, what is Dobler saying to us here? 
as an echo or other sound guys. You're welcome. We make our life easy, isn't it? <laughs> so this is the idea. If you have this area, there is a certain pressure with certain velocity. So you, you have the area and the velocity, and the pressure will be created by that. When it's go to narrower area, what will happen the, to the velocity? It needs to continue with the same flow. So it will increase the velocity. With the increased velocity, what will happen to the pressure? It will go down. Okay, this is why the pressure here is high. The blood can, uh, the fluid can spill from here, and the pressure here will go down. It's the same idea how the airplane is flying. So, Bernoulli is really applied in a lot of things. It's like when the pressure, when the velocity or the air uh, velocity hit the wing, it, some of it will go up, some of it will go down. The one down is have a lower velocity, so it has higher pressure. This is what will let the plane take off. And the one above has a higher velocity and lower pressure, so it can go. So anybody is memorizing Bernoulli equation? <laughs> I, I believe that Turchawa does. I, I don't, uh, but in true life, anybody can attend that. <laughs> Nobody really have time for that. So they took the pressure gradient and they start to like eliminate some of the factors that are not truly effective on the formula. What's viscosity, the resistance, the elasticity. So they make the modified Bernoulli equation, which is four and the velocity V1 uh, squared minus V1 squared. So the velocity, for example, if this is the aorta, this will be the LVOT. We always see it in the echo, V1 and V2. Are we using this one? We use the simplified Bernoulli equation, which is the easiest one. This one has its own uh, like situations. Uh, whenever, because they said that V1 is usually low velocity and it's negligible. So you can remove it from the equation. However, for example, if you are calculating the aortic valve stenosis and there is high velocity in the LVOT, more than 1.5, you should include V1. So there are some examples. When you have sequence of stenosis, you should use it. Otherwise, you will overestimate or like have a false information. And from now we know that we have the velocity, the pressure gradient, the direction, we can get the flow. Now. We know the area, if we know the velocity, we can calculate how much blood, how much fluid is going through. And if we are missing one of the equation, for example, if we know the cross-sectional area here and the velocity here, and the velocity in the other narrow chamber, we can bring the cross-sectional area. You get it? So any, I mean, the, the amount of flow here is equal to the amount of flow here. Just the difference, it's the cross-sectional area, the area and the velocity. Whatever you are missing in the equation, you can get it. And the blood flowing here should be equal to the blood flowing there. And from that, we can get how much blood is flowing, what is the area, what is the velocity, and so on. But what's the problem? I said that we in blood, it's it's pulsatile. It's not one. It's one, not one move. It will have acceleration, peak, and deceleration. So we need to come up with something that make it easy to use. What did they do? They made this uh, velocity time uh, integral, and it's it's a, a bit complex way, but the easiest way to understand is like the summation of velocity of all the velocities under the curve. This is the easiest way. And VTI, it is velocity over time. How much velocity over this time, over this beat, over this flow. So when we put velocity, which is centimeter per second, over time, which is second, the second, We'll go with the other second. This is our VTI is what? By centimeter. This is why they call it what? Stroke distance. Because it's by centimeter. So how much, how much fluid is running over this distance? This is 
if we take it in an easy way. How much fluid? Like, for example, running at this centimeter, which is equal to the, or sometimes, which we can get from it, the stroke volume. Here, just to let you know that it has uh, many names. Whenever the thing is important, it will have many names, like uh, little chap. Like, for example, in my phone, he's my boss. Another phone, he's like my head, and like, like that. So, velocity time integrity, they will put structure in distance, they will say it's BTI, TDI. It's confusing sometimes, but good to know the names. It's really important to know that it's in centimeters because when you do the cross-sectional area, you should do it also in centimeters and not to get com confused. And whatever result come from it, it will be in centimeters cube or mil. This is why we get, when we do it, we get what? The stroke volume. Now we come to the types of Doppler. Uh, so it's basically divided into two, spectral and uh, color. Spectral because we can display it on the screen. So the main thing that we have is the pulse and the continuous. The pulse wave, the, the probe will send a frequency and wait and will listen and wait for the, this pulse to come back to, to be interpreted. This is why when it's sent, it will be crisp at the outside. However, in the middle, it will not record anything. It will just listen to whatever is there. So it will just plot the velocity of that place over time. However, the continuous, it's continuously sending, it's continuously receiving. And it can get you all, all the way, like the inflow, the regage, and at any velocity, it will not tell you where is it. Is it in the mid cavity? Is it in the LBOT? Is it in the valve? Beyond? It will never tell you. Okay? So why we don't use pulse all the time? Pulse, we, we always say pulse is range specific. I want just the pulmonary veins, and it will pulse the pulmonary veins. At, at the end of the heart, it will get it. However, the continuous, it will not differentiate. So what's the benefit? And this is why we call the pulse range specific. Give me this pulse. However, the, the CW, we call it range ambiguous. So why we don't use pulse all the time? CW allows you to find higher velocities. What is this? You show me that before the aliasing picture. This is the aliasing. So you can see. The night question. Yeah, it's. Uh, so you can see it flowing on one side. Then after it's getting fast, your eye cannot keep up and it will start spinning to the other way. This depends what is this we call it aliasing because we uh, exceed our Nyquist limit, which is like uh, we can say it in um, the Nyquist limit is like described as the maximum Doppler shift that can be interpreted by the device because each frequency has different and so depends on the depth. Uh, after we exceed this Doppler shift, we cannot interpret or we have range ambiguity. We cannot know this signal is coming forward or going back. It's like just the helicopter we saw. We know the direction, however, we see the opposite way. So it's all depend on the sampling rate or pulse repetitive frequency. Uh, let's say here. Um, Let's go to the example. We'll have a simple, nice example. Imagine that I want, if, if uh, we have, we know that we have a frequency, which is it's about cycles. Imagine we have a high sampling uh, rate and we will get one dot here, one dot here, here, and we keep sampling every half, Amplitude, for example. So, what we will have at the end? Multiple points interpreted on this frequency. Imagine that we will sample here in a lower rate, in a lower sampling rate. So, we will sample here. 
then I will skip this one and I will go to the next, for example, here. And then I will skip this one and go here. And I skip this one and, and like that. So what will happen if I match the dots here, it will be like that. It is similar to the frequency that we just saw, isn't it? However, if we match this one, it will be wrong in, long in interpretation of the signal. And this is the example of frequency. The higher you sample, the better you understand. However, sometimes some of the velocity can exceed the capability of the of the probe, like the helicopter exceed the capability of our eyes to interpret the direction. So how it will be plotted? It will come from the other side. Okay, it will wrap around. It will exceed whatever velocity you have, and it will come to the other side. The most common example is the LBOT. Whenever you have aortic regage, the aortic regage is high velocity, always it will wrap around. And it's beyond the limit. So, and this is this was in um, spectral Doppler, and in color Doppler we have our famous PISA method. You can see the difference in color. It will shift. It cannot interpret the velocity here, so it will shift from blue to to yellow. So it's like it reach its maximum here, and then it went all the way back to the yellow. So we can know the exact velocity here. So it is artifact, but we can use it for our advantage. Also, it's depend on a lot of factors, not just the frequency. For example, this is the same patient. When we pulse or when we put the color on the aortic and the mitral valve, what is the Nyquist limit here? It's 61. The moment we try to interrogate the interatrial septum or the hepatic, it went down. So it's affected by distance also. It's neat. The, the more the depth, the lower your Nyquist limit, the more aliasing, the more difficulty you will have. So, and the last thing that I want to say, it's the uh, color doubler. Color doubler is the same as pulse doubler. However, it is multiple, depending on the box that you put, okay? And the bigger the box, the more the pulses, and the lower your uh, uh, frame rate. And this is an example of the pulse. It's like pulsing every single the blood uh, flow here. Whatever is not interpreted, either it did not reach the, the speed or it is better in flow. And it will give you this mosaic color whenever we have higher velocity. So most of my lectures are taken from those two books. And just to be honest and to refer to it. And really, I advise whoever like want to start his career to like his new beginner in ECHO to read from those two. I know they will say it's a lot, but it can be like summarized. And the book, I told Dr. Chow I will speak about uh, double artifact. However, I thought it's too much to explain, and I'm I will do part two with the with the pulse and continuous. So it will be explained at that time. Just remember that double it's the colorful flowers of the of the heart. It would make understanding better and the patient life better. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So thank you, Yasid. Uh, often talking about um, echo physics is one of the more challenging things to do, especially to make it entertaining and interesting. So um, any questions from the audience? So I have a question for all. So you know about color Doppler, being B-A-R-T, so blue away, red towards. And um, the two questions are, who invented the color Doppler as we see them today? Which country and why blue away and red towards? Well, 
Christian Doppler is the one who described the Doppler phenomena based on double star, because back then there was not, nothing moved fast enough than a horse carriage uh, back in Czech Republic and Prague, um, so on and so forth. So, um, so anyone, you, you have been practicing color Doppler for years, right? And you just accepted that, you know, that's the color convention. So um, the person who invented is actually Sujio um, Satomura, who's actually from Japan. So originally, the first color Doppler was uh, implemented uh, in a Toshiba machine, so from way, way back when. It was actually done in vascular first. So now you can imagine why they have blue away and red to it. So imagine you're imaging the leg or like your upper extremity from the distal. So, so the warm blood is coming towards you and the like not so warm blood is going back. So coming back is arterial, going away is venous. So that actually is the reason. Because if you are into astronomy, that's exactly the opposite in astronomy. When you talk about red shift and blue shift, because the first time when I saw it, it makes no sense to me why the imaging people would actually use the opposite as in uh, astronomy. Because I learned astronomy first when I was in high school. So um, being a true geek in math and <laughs> physics and you know astronomy comes very naturally afterwards to understand the stars and the skies. So um, any other questions from the audience? Well, you are the best, he says. Congratulations. You have fans. Good. Sophia is one of our uh, ecotech. And Wonderful. She's, she's really uh, like, uh, into eco. And she's presenting, by the way, lectures in congenital land. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. And, and from Saudi? Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us all the way.